Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Lenny here, and I have Miss Jody in the house. How are you doing? So dynamite. Glad, glad to be here. Yeah, so happy to have you. So what I like to do with my guests is like they tell their story where they want to start and we'll kind of go from there. Um, I say that and people are like, oh, that's a big thing. I don't mean like two years old, but like <laughs> you're, you're welcome to start where you want to and we'll go from there. <laughs> I like that. Keeps it open. Yeah. 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 Well, I like to very much begin with the end in mind. And I mean that like literally and figuratively uh, channeling a little, what's that, like uh, Stephen Covey. And so the where I am now to me is the most important because it's, of course, a reflection of where I came. But I am so stoked every freaking day because I count down the rest of my life. And so my business is called 4,000 Mondays because that's roughly all we're going to get. And all right, let's be honest. Some of us will exceed 4,000, mm -hmm. but unfortunately many mm -hmm. of us will not. Mm -hmm. And so having tapped into this mission in my life to help us wake up to the autopilot we slip into, you know, we take life for granted. And so now that I, my life is centered entirely around this notion of wake up, time's ticking. Uh, that to me is like, this is exactly where I need and want to be um, after me making adjustments along the way. Yeah. You know, um, so 10 years ago, I left my corporate job at the time and got into leadership development and coaching. And that was great and fine. And I could never figure out why is it not enough? Oh, I know why. It's because it's not the thing I'm the most passionate about in mm -hmm. the entire planet. Uh, and so I've had fun with the corporate thing for 17 years, the leadership stuff for 10. And then now this uh, has just been like this. This is this is being plugged into life. And I want everybody to feel that. So I have something that I came up, there's two themes I live by now that came up, it took me about six months to noodle around with it. And I think you'll appreciate it because it hits on the vein you're talking about. I only get into business now and I only do things in this world that I, I only run races. I can't win. Oh, oh, I'm smitten. Because what I found, because I'm a high performance coach and a mindset coach, is that a lot of people don't procrastinate because the, it's not they're not procrastinating it's that the goal or the the why or the need for them is not big enough yeah so the mountain's not big enough yeah. it's not that you're swimming in the wrong tank the shark's in the minnow tank mm -hmm. mm. i love that so much that requires some seriously fabulous growth mindset which clearly you have but mm -hmm. it freaks people out right it does because 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 well what freaks them out is they lose friends that's what freaks them <laughs> Because I've realized, yeah. right, I've interviewed 700 plus people, right, on multiple podcasts, right, mm -hmm. in a three-year stretch. And what I found is the community they lose is almost more scary than the money or the house or the car. Mm -hmm. Because in the reaching and attaining success, people can't handle their bright light? Is that the... Yes and no, word? but more importantly, by you being great, you're going to leave others behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny, the space I play in, I don't talk unduly about death. Well, that's not true. That's a total lie. I talk all the time about death, but it's not the act of dying that is as, as interesting to me as it is as the motivator. But it's this notion though of acceptance, right? That like, yeah, we already understand logically that we're going to go, but we don't really stop and live our lives like it. And like what you're saying, we're not accepting of there's an evolution. Every friend, every pet, every person we know and love and care about, they're not only are they going to die like us, but things are changing and evolving. And so it is funny that we like to hold on to this notion about like, I want these buddies in my life or this family matters so much when like we're destined to evolve. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say it to my audience in a different way that maybe doesn't scare them as much. Mm. The, the conversation around death reminds me of the weather. Okay. And, mm. and hang with me here is that we talk about the weather as if it hasn't done the same thing for a hundred plus years. Why do I need to talk about, Hey, guess what? I'm gonna let you know a secret. It's hot in Texas. Oh, holy crap. Wow. Revolution. Okay. We walk around as if these things 
patterns, the universe, the, the world shows us the same things over and over again. My favorite person in the entire world to listen to is Jim Rohn. Mm. And he talks about, you know, when do the mornings come after the nights? Mm -hmm. Every day, 365. Mm -hmm. You're, 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 you're spending your whole life second guessing everything that you do. And then when you get to the end of it, you haven't lived. Mm -hmm. That's why you're really upset. Right. Thank you for saying that because research shows that our relationship, our anxiety about death is often in direct proportion to the belief we have, whether we have lived our lives fully or whether we have life left unlived. And that notion scares me in a fabulous way, right? It's that, mm -hmm. oh, I, we can live our lives in such a way that we don't get to the end and feel like it was unlived. That to mm -hmm. me is the, the greatest shame that would be out there. It's well, like we didn't is, do it justice. Do you think that's why you moved from Chicago to Palm Springs and you're writing a book is, is kind of that you stoked your own flame with your own adventure? Oh, for sure. I'm super conscious. A lot of the work I do is around the idea of infusing our lives with novelty. And many of us, like that, I mean, because it's the opposite of autopilot, which is when we get into the every day is the same, our life is passing us by. And you need to throw a wrench in things intentionally. And that, again, it, it jolts us because we don't love the change. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, this was a decision about, you know, in life when you have these notions and it's like, you need to bust yourself every now and then and go, are we all talk, no action? If mm -hmm. you keep talking about an idea, whether it's for a business or a dream or a hobby you want to take up or a language you want to learn or a town you want to move to. You can only talk about it for so long before it's just going to die on the vine or maybe you die first. And so, yeah, I think for me, it was like, Oh, hon, like to the husband, like, let's make this happen. You know, yeah. like, like we, like, we're not the type of people we let's not become, let's not continue being the type yes. of people because we want to, a bit. let's be honest, like we can't live lives that are willy nilly. We need some certainty and comfort and uh, I get it. Uh, and we need to, we need to, we need to shake stuff up. Like I look at it as like a snow globe. We need to shake it up every now and then. And mm -hmm. then the little pieces fall in different ways that lets us live life with just a little more joie de vivre or maybe mm -hmm. more, more meaning, whatever it is, mm -hmm. whatever you need, but we got to shake it up. So yeah, moving was part of that. Have you ever read the book, Big Magic? You ever heard of that book? Oh yeah. Yep. Okay. Big, yeah. So there's a very, you know, it's the poignant story I've shared it 50 million times. You know, mm -hmm. the, the woman in Minnesota has an idea for uh, a, you know, a book about a 19, you know, Oh three coal miner, gold miner from Argentina in a small town that falls in love, like this whole random story. Right. And then she meets her, she sits on this story for like three years and she meets her mentor in LA and her mentor meets her at a conference and goes, well, I have an idea for a coal mine story in Argentina this year. And she realized that she hadn't taken, she hadn't gripped that story and that creativity went on to somebody else. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love that notion. I think that there's such encouragement there, right? It's like, I believe that that's a motivation to act. T Tupac said, he said, I have to write this song because if I don't, or no, it was Michael Jackson said, I have to write this song because if I don't, Prince will. Mm, that's so beautiful. I love it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're, we're translating this into something that I use. And this has been done a million times before, you know, the deathbed regrets idea, mm -hmm. right? Like I, there's nothing more visceral than stopping and imagining if, life was over tonight, what would be the things you'd kick yourself for? And like, let's dismiss the stupid stuff you did because the, I was going to say sins of commission, um, regrets of commission, the dumb things we did, that, that's water under the bridge. And also most people, we know enough to know that we can't change it and we can rationalize it. And we often learn from them. I'm more interested in those regrets at the end, which could be those ideas that you didn't write that book about the coal miner, gold miner, whatever the miner, or that you didn't write that song and you're kicking yourself, you know, that mm -hmm. like, if anything is kick worthy or pang worthy, holy crap, like let's tune into that now and then live our lives in such a way that we actually show up and, and do some of the things. And then we can't do it all. There will be enough time to do it all. I mean, people like us and the people, your listeners, we like, we have all sorts of goals and dreams and like, okay, put them in freaking rank order. And let's chip away at the ones that matter the most today. That's, I mean, let's, let's not get to the end with that coulda, shoulda, woulda mentality.
And what was the, was there a moment? Was it a, a series of moments that, that got you so inspired with this kind of direction that your life is mm -hmm. heading with your business and everything? Was there something that happened? I think a series, you're right. So I lost my mom in her late fifties and I believed she died with a bunch of regrets in her life, you know, that I, that I saw when I was cleaning up her place. And it was like this, oh man, like dear sweet mom, like you look at all these manuscripts or look at all these business ideas. And she just didn't pull the trigger. And that gripped me because I knew at that time I was living a life where I was stuck in my corporate job that, you know, the trappings of success kind of stuck. And it made me realize, okay, we're not all going to get 4,000 Mondays and I want to get on with it because I've got all sorts of dreams and ideas. Some are cockamamie, some are fantastically fabulous and some of them are like, but all shapes and sizes, let's just make some, something happen here. So my mom was a big part of it. Um, I had eating disorders for 10 years, which I look back on now and I just see with such clarity, like, oh my God, I was totally deferring my existence you know, I was scared and I was trying to control things in a way that like you, you can't, but man, a girl can try. And so I realize now, like I was kind of dead inside in a way that now I realize, oh, there's life on the other side of the way we try to cope. Like, you know, with your background and your story, you were just trying to cope with just stuff you didn't know how to deal with mechanisms we have that are dysfunctional. And so like, let's get help with the stuff that's holding us back so that we can live fully mm -hmm all the highs, all the lows. Um, so those were some, some big deals. Oh, and the last thing that I would be remiss if I didn't go through is that I was afraid to talk about mortality and not turn everybody off. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. it's obviously not the most popular topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found my sea legs by studying it. So I went to school at UPenn, there you go, Pennsylvania. Uh, and I uh, studied it as part of the um, Masters of Applied Positive Psychology program. And it gave me this sense of, oh, this is legit. And I don't know why I needed the mm -hmm. legitimacy. Like, I don't believe that we have to go and study something uh, in order to make it like official that we can talk about it and think about it. But for me, it gave me confidence that I, mm -hmm. that I needed in order to go, oh, this is a thing. This memento mori idea, which is Latin for remember we must die. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some good stuff behind it. So that kicked me off big time. I love that. And what aspect of it... Um... Have you found people have the hardest time with? Hmm. Meaning, meaning I see it all the time, right? Um, I have a client who's 30 years uh, alcoholic. Um, he's been coaching with me for six months. I've never brought up uh, stop drinking ever, mm -hmm. uh, but he's barely drinking now. And so what I've found is like, people's fear of death and using in your context might be actually seated in something else, not actually mm -hmm. fear of death. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, what, what do people have a hard time understanding? It's the same way. We don't talk about sex. Uh, we mm -hmm. don't talk about alcohol and then we don't talk mm -hmm. about death. You know, those are the mm -hmm. things that we don't talk about in this, in this mm -hmm. world, which cracked me up. I know. Right. And so all right. I mean, the common human experience, you know, I, okay, so I've learned that the conversation around death, there are three categories and I play in the safest, easiest space. So there's death, dying, and grief. Okay. So grief's obvious, you know, sorry, you lost your aunt and how you're going to handle that. There's a whole science and I don't know, study around that. And then there's dying, which is what people call like the good death, like having your affairs in order, dying with dignity, all that stuff, like uh, the gory act of dying. I don't play there either. Uh, mm -hmm. I am in the you know, a little more comfortable zone of the, using the idea of it again as the motivator, right? It's more of the concept. Yeah. So I'm two steps removed from the heartache. Mm -hmm. And so it does make it easier. So I don't necessarily talk with people about their existential fears. I just approach it in a different way. So I admit that I don't deal with, I don't get the uh, horror and anxiety. What mm -hmm. I get is the normal human condition, which is, ah, I've pinpointed these are the dream. This is what I'm longing to do. I want to do it. And then it's that we need consistent reminders that your time's ticking. So even though I could say at a workshop that we get everybody to count their Mondays, it's kind of like part of my thing. Everyone counts their Mondays. Oh, look at that. 1,800 or whatever the number is going to be. And we wake up a little bit 
And then we go back to the office and we do the TPS mm -hmm. report and we go and pick up the dry cleaning and then we have to go and then we watch mm -hmm. Netflix. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden we've kind of like lost the plot again. Mm -hmm. The thing I notice is that it's, it's a consistent little, it, like it's a consistent little push and nudge we need to go, mm -hmm. oh no, but really. And that's why my place is littered with uh, skulls and little countdown timers and all the things that are like reminding us that get on with it. Don't defer your life that you'll do it in retirement. Do you know how many people I just met an anesthesiologist who is like the number of people I meet that get cancer right after they retire. And of course I was like, is there a correlation there? But, but like you're deferring life for a, for an uncertain future. And also don't you want, don't you feel sorry for the life you're living now? Doesn't it deserve a little love and fun and meaning? So <laughs> I for me, a... the thing I know this is fear live. It's if it's people are more afraid of living than they are afraid of dying. Thousand percent. I had a client this morning. He went on vacation with his family and I was giving him a hard time because he was like, I feel great. And I'm like, yeah, it's almost like if you go out in nature and spend time with your family that they love you more. What a freaking wild concept. And I've said, you know what's actually funny and all the coaching I've done? If I just coached on the obvious of life, I would be, you know, we I'd be the best coach in the world. We are <laughs> like Common sense. I drink a little water, work out a little bit, have fun with your friends, listen to some music. Whoa, crazy, you know? Rocket science, you're crazy is right. But yeah. what we do is subconsciously, we create boundaries and, and, and hills that we have to jump over because we want to give ourselves an out and excuse. Yeah, we're scared. We're I scared. mean, I mean, come on. I mean, I- Because you like, know I was what's crazy? We, yeah. I have, I don't give a fuck anymore. You have no idea how much I don't give a shit. Like mm -hmm. some bad shit went down last week, like some real bad shit. I yeah. cleaned it up, fixed it, shifted it around in 24 hours. Like that to me is like, I yeah. just don't like, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and be scared anymore because mm -hmm. it's just like, whatever, dude, like just move mm -hmm. on. We have a saying in our company on to the next, mm -hmm. on to the next. Mm -hmm. If you don't mm -hmm. vibe don't with our vision, if you don't yeah. see that we're out for the good people over profit, yeah. if you don't see that everything I do is a happy a result, then I don't want yeah. I don't want you to be a part of. I love what you're saying, and I'm going to connect our dots together because you're reminding me of the work I do, and I'm inspired by people who have had those brushes with death. Because mm -hmm. man, their eyes have been opened in ways that the rest of us mere mortals mm -hmm. we just haven't mm -hmm. even seen. Yeah. And I like, that's the work I strive to do, right. Is create like the, the experience of like a near death experience without any of the gore. Mm -hmm. And that means like, why is it that they're living in a way, like kind of how you described where they don't give a shit anymore because their priorities have been recalibrated. It's like, I don't need to sweat the small stuff because I've seen mm -hmm. the light and I know that that's inconsequential. It's trivial. Mm -hmm. It's stupid. Answering your email today versus tomorrow like stab my face. Like, it doesn't matter anymore. What really matters is, and then they've identified the big things that do matter. That stark clarity of what is important and that sense of urgency then to get the fuck on with it. That's the stuff that I'm so inspired by. How did you get there though? Cause you didn't peer over the, I mean, you've had some, some, some past, but how, how is it you're living a life now where you don't care? Well, one of the, my favorite things that a mentor said to me is to say, most walk around living other people's injected values within them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's the truth. And I think, you know, what people don't understand about what's happened to me mm -hmm. is that when you burn your motherfucking life to the ground about nine different times and you, blow, and you blow it up, there is actually some fucking peace and freedom because you get to leave it all behind. Oh, and then you travel light. Then you travel light and you go, you know what? I'm not going to do that again. Mm -hmm. like, what's crazy, right? Is I realized that the, the, the edge between addiction and not addiction mm -hmm. is the spiral. Mm -hmm. It's not the one event. It's the mm -hmm. one event that leads into two to three to four that turns mm -hmm. into a month, a two month. Mm -hmm. Like when I got better and started getting better, you would now that deep, dark depression or that spiral would last yeah. a week. Uh, uh, three days, yeah. two days. Uh, now it can last 15 minutes. Like, boom, uh, recalibrate. Cool. Yeah. Like, because here's what's crazy. And I've, and I haven't shared this once on the fucking podcast. The last mm -hmm. six months of last year, I don't want to do anything. Nothing. I'm getting annihilated by clients. 
fucking, I lost half a million dollars for business deals, clients, dumb shit, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's one after another real estate deals falling through. But yeah. you know what? I always said to myself, one day it'll click. You'll be, yeah. you'll be back. But I still yeah. showed up. I still did the podcast. I still coached. I still worked. I still did my things. I still made it happen. Yeah. Yeah. And then one day, like a hundred days ago, it just, yeah. I stepped out from my morning walk. And when the foot hit, I go, boom, you're back. You're back, really? baby. You're in it. Like, it's like you, I broke through the ceiling. One of my mentors also mm. said, make your ceiling your new floor. Mm. Mm. Okay. You're describing, I love that you've shared that. And you're describing something that's kind of cool. Cause it's not just about how external circumstances happen to you. That's part of it. You're mm-hmm. in the midst of whatever's going on externally, client stuff. I'm not stuff, scared to feel it anymore. Stuff. I'm not scared to feel it. I live inside uh-huh. the chaos tornado. Yes. You know? Okay. But the, mind, like is, but the mind is clear, right? That's mm-hmm. the difference. Because I was the tornado beforehand. <laughs> Everyone around you. Know, you, you know what I told my CEO the other day? He goes, dude, business is getting wild. He's like, it's getting crazy. We're building it up. And I, he goes, dude, it's like a tornado in here. And I said, no. When I whisper to the tornado, I say, it's motherfucking Austin. And he He's, he, he fucking can't. He thinks it's the funniest thing in the world. He goes, you literally text me that. And he, he tells it in my voice and I fall over because I was so serious about it. Because <laughs> what happens is, is that I realize that if I truly want to do what I want to do, which is create impact at scale, which is my only why, yeah. I'm going to affect everybody that I'm around at all times and every, in every situation. Um, then I yeah. have to live free. I have to be the motherfucking fireman running through the fire door before anybody else. And you know what's yeah. crazy? Now that you yeah. say that and it's clicking, yeah. I realize that in order to be the best coach and the best person I can to lead a company, I have to jump yeah. through the burning building first. And when I, when I realize that it's for other people, uh, I don't have any fear for myself. Oh, right. Because it's like the mission at hand is just so clear. It's exactly. bigger than you. My, one of the guys I, I've interviewed on the podcast, he goes, I never met somebody that has such a clear vision on exactly what they want to do. And, and I'll share you, I'll share you mine. They say, they say, what's your, what's the root? Like, what's the big, the big thing? I could say, oh, it's so it's so simple. It's so simple. So I'm 70 years old. We're in, we're in Tuscany, Italy on a 10 acre farm where I have two Airbnb stone houses that I cooked them breakfast and uh, out of the garden and uh, I don't drink anymore, but I made them my own wine and, and, and they're the guests. And so I walk down to the market to get the food for dinner that I'm going to prepare for them because I used to be a chef. And across the street, somebody yells out, holy shit, that's motherfucking Austin Linney. And he runs up to me and I said, hey, man, like, I appreciate that, but I don't know who you are. And he goes, I know you don't, but you coach so-and-so and so-and-so changed my life. So thank you. Oh, oh, I mean, can we not all just take a moment of freaking silence for that? Like, and I love how, how, how vivid it is. There's such cool research about how when you have a dream, you need to pepper it with exactly what you did. I could smell the herbs in your cooking. I could, I could tell that I saw the wine glasses and then I saw the guy like you have it seared in. There's no way that's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, what's crazy is I did now, now this is where I try to keep it between the lines because my fiance has taught me a lot. I went to go do a reading from this lady um, uh, in Austin Mm -hmm. and she said, I'm picking up, this is a true story. She said, I'm picking up a white suit in the Mediterranean with a, a sailboat and food and music. And I said, what the fuck are you talking about and she goes i go my dream is to host a party on a catamaran in the mediterranean in the greek isles mm-hmm. but, but see but see that's what we don't do when when my clients mm-hmm. come to me and they go i want this car no 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 i need you to tell me what the color mm-hmm. so when i travel right i work a lot like i work a lot like today's a seven to seven straight through all day meaning i'm about mm-hmm. to run out of here go try to get a bunch of money from people's money in the company. It's a whole, right? <laughs> but when I travel that moment, I could tell you exactly, I could, I could explain to you one and you'll know it because you live there. Okay. I'll explain one to you. There was a moment 
when I got separated from my wife, I went to Joshua Tree. I stayed on 30 acres in an, in a, in an Airstream. And I purposely put my phone away because I didn't want to take a picture. I wanted to experience it. Okay. I wanted it to register in my brain because when I'm in those moments, I take a mental picture. So when I'm in the grind, I know what I'm grinding for. Okay. Mm -hmm. The wind was blowing 30 miles an hour. I was surrounded by mountains and it was the pinkest sunshine sunset I've ever seen in my entire existence. I can hear it. I can see it right now. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I felt like the sun set for like three hours. Mm. Mm. And that was like the moment that I always go back to when I'm like, I don't want to do it, or I've got to do another Zoom call. Like I think about mm -hmm. uh, the Grand Tetons. I think about Costa Rica. I think about, uh, well, what's the, what's, what are you doing? What do you, what, yeah. The, you know? So you have these vivid like anchor points that yes. keep you centered. Yes. And grounded and reconnected to the stuff, the why, like the reason. The, this is the point, if even the when it's grueling and hard. How will figure itself out. Yeah. yeah. I love it. You know? Can I and ask like, you if you, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I'm curious if you, because you live, you clearly live uh, and lead with such intention. Would there be anything that if you were to find yourself on your deathbed that you would feel like, man, I didn't, I didn't do that thing. Yeah, I mean, do. the only thing on the list that hasn't happened yet that's scheduled, um, I'm obsessed with Italy, Croatia, Norway, mm -hmm. and Banff, Canada, and I haven't been yet. Uh, so like, those okay. are like the only ones. Uh, I'd like okay. to go to Thailand too. It's all travel okay. stuff. It's all travel okay. stuff. Experience um, out there. Yep. Yeah, it's all experiences. Um, for me, no, because okay. I have... 800 podcasts and about 5,000 videos that it could be my legacy. I still got more to do. Mm. Um, I would say, I would say it already happened for me. Um, mm. I, mm, I didn't have a relationship with my father for 20 years. Um, mm. per, pretty much. I was in mm. Costa Rica. I was with my coach. It was five in the morning. Mm -hmm. We were walking through his neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I stopped mm -hmm. and I literally just stopped what I was doing. And I go, holy fucking shit. The reason I don't like my dad is because we're the same person. Mm -hmm. I go, I'm running for myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not mad at him. Mm -hmm. And I have not really spoke to my dad. I'm dead serious. Like not really like I spent maybe once every year, like there's six years we didn't talk. You know what my mm -hmm. dad does? For 35 years, my dad's been a consultant to small businesses. Exactly what I do. <laughs> of course. <laughs> now he's on the board. Now we talk every day. You know, oh. we rekindled that relationship. But our rekindling has inspired three other fathers and sons to reconnect. Well, that is beautiful in a demonstration, too, of the social contagion theory, right? Like, when we're around, that's the reason why, you know, we surround ourselves with people who are our type and motivating and, and ideally up-leveled so that we, uh, we catch a, from a contagious effect what they're up to. And that's why we want positive and not negative. And there's even evidence about how there are three degrees of separation. So in a way, you're talking about a, a ripple effect, which is beautiful. And there's a funny thing where being mindful of the someone you're going to hang out with and choose to spend your precious time with. It's about how do you make me feel, but now this is going to get a little, little narrow and we're not going to go there, but you're also experiencing a, a, an effect of who their friends are and who their friends, friends are, because it's that contagious of an effect. So your description though, of inspiring re reconciliation, that's the thing that happens in social networks when there's a good kind of contagion. I love this. Well, what I think is great, right? And and just I'm an energy like feel guy, and that's like my jam. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have to read one single page of your book to know it's going to be a bestseller. And and the reason is because there's not a word on that page that wasn't put in with deep intention and thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. Because I can mm -hmm. I can tell your personality, I can tell the intention. <laughs> you're not you're not in it to like sell books, even though you will. You're in it to create something that's deeper than you. And so the uh, words that live on the page will live for the years to come. And it won't matter how many you sold because that book will impact said person. And that's all that matters. You know what? 
you totally made my day, first of all, for even saying that. And thank you. And I, like, I believe this also for the way you express, right? It's like, it's from the freaking soul. Like it, it, it's heartfelt. It's legit. It's real. It's raw. It's vulnerable. You know what my fiance all says all the time? She, she'll literally tell people that we randomly meet. She goes, this is real. He's not fake. Like <sighs> you just like people think it's no, I'm dead serious. People think I'm putting them on or like it's a scam or something. And she's like, no, like he's so real that it scares the shit out of you how real he is. <laughs> you just can't handle the real. But, but, but that's, what's great is right. Is because, because one of the things I try to do, and I think you're doing it in your teachings is I try to give people the cover to be themselves, mm. whichever way, meaning we have a problem, right? The mm -hmm. podcast lights, not right. The scenery's mm -hmm. not wrong. The camera's not great. And we, 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 we put off and we do, and we put off and we put off, Hey, start it messy. My favorite yes. thing to do is called messy action. Ooh, that's brilliant. Messy action. Just take ridiculous amounts of action. Don't care about all the parameters of it and just yeah. see where you go. And I promise you'll learn more out about yourself. Yeah. Well, it sounds like also you're willing to then see what emerges, right? Like what, whatever cream rises to the top or where your energy is, because sometimes like, I believe we live small and narrow. So I have this notion, like, of course we want to live longer. Okay, fine. Obviously, as long as we're, you know, healthy, but I like the idea about living wider and deeper. So the widening yeah. part of life is adding in more vitality, more of the pleasure, fun, the hedonic side of life. And then there's the deepening of life, which is more about the meaning. So the purpose, the connection to something bigger, et cetera. Right. And so yeah. when you look at that kind of interplay together, there can be a way to a sort of diagnose our lives and see do I need a little more width? Cause like I've got meaning, yeah. but like, I'm, I'm just like asleep with the switch here. Well, it's so freaking boring. Right. Well, like, see the way I view people is like here, their circle. Okay. And all these parts of the circle make who make up who they are. But yet we spend all of our time on the things that make us money. Not knowing that the things that don't make us money are the reasons that we make money in the first place. Oh yeah. I like that. So meaning like my client who makes $5 million a year is yeah. unfulfilled but his favorite thing to do in the world is golf and fish, but he hasn't golfed and fish for three years. Okay. You're you nailing. <laughs> There's this whole idea that drives me and it's, it drives me part crazy, but also part inspired, right? Cause there's a fine line. And it is this idea that, uh, of people I work with, I just did a workshop last week where getting people to identify what makes you feel most alive. Okay. And for many, it is something that they have not done in years. So one guy was like, I am, I come alive when I'm surfing. I'm like, oh God, that sounds fabulous. Where do you live? He lives in fucking Idaho. I'm like, there's not a lot of surfing in Idaho. Okay. When was the last time you surfed? He hasn't surfed since before COVID. And then you look at it and you go, this is your one wild and precious life. And if you know there's something that plugs you into that energy source of aliveness and all the things that are going to wake you up, we owe it to ourselves to find a way to make that happen. And so there are so many stories of the life we used to live, right? I used to love to paint or, oh man, when I was at the dojo, it was yeah. like, those were the best years of my life. When I'm like, mm -hmm. if you're not handicapped, go back to the dojo, mm -hmm. right? Go and order on Amazon. It'll be there in two days, a new canvas and paintbrush, like plug yeah. the fuck in because our Dude, time is ticking right i gotta i gotta send you a song i gotta send you a song my buddy wrote mm -hmm. uh but what i want to do is if people want to find out about you they want to know uh what uh how to get a hold of you they want to make sure they get the book when it gets out how would they do that thanks for asking i can be found at 4000 mondays.com it's not it. easy i love it guys if you like this episode send it to a friend and we'll see you next time